First of all, I would like to thank Professor Steinhauser for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here in Bonn. Um, my today's talk will focus, actually it will focus on onion transport, but, but on a special type of onion transporter, on uh, onion channels that are associated with glutamate transporters expressed in neuronal and glial cells. Yeah, as you all know, glutamate is a major excitatory um, neurotransmitter in the mammalian central nervous system. It's released from the presynaptic nerve terminal, crosses the synaptic cleft, and then binds to postsynaptic uh, receptors, thus generating several types of postsynaptic signals. Glutaminergic transmission is terminated by the reuptake of glutamate in surrounding glial and neuronal cells. And this is the main task of a family of glutamate transporters, the so-called excitatory amino acid transporters. There are five different isoforms. Two of those are glial-specific, EAT1 and EAT2. The remaining ones are expressed either in postsynaptic or presynaptic nerve terminals. The physiological importance of, of these neuronal and uh, glial glutamate transport is highlighted by several pathological conditions in which changes of glutamate homeostasis occur. For example, brain ischemia, in which the glutamate transport appears to reverse. Uh, changed glutamate concentration has been uh, suggested as a pathophysiological process in neurodegenerative disorders or affective disorder. And lastly, in the last years, uh, monogenetic forms of movement disorders have been shown to be caused by mutations in one particular glutamate transporter. And I will, uh, I will speak about this uh, particular aspect of glutamate transporters within my talk. EAT transporters are not only of high physiological importance, they are also biophysically very interesting and very beautiful because they are capable of mediating two thermodynamically different transport processes. They are secondary active transporters moving glutamate coupled to the movement of sodium and proton and an exchange with potassium across the membrane. And moreover, they are capable to me mediate chloride currents in a transport process which is not thermodynamically coupled to glutamate transport. The secondary active transport has been studied in detail in the last 20, 30 years and uh, also due to the occurrence of several high-resolution three-dimensional structures, we know a lot about the mechanisms underlying coupled transport. In contrast, so far we know very little about the molecular mechanism of anion conductors, about the physiological role this transport process serves, and moreover, about the pathophysiology. This is a ribbon, ribbon diagram of a high-resolution structure of a bacterial glutamate transporter. You see that these transporters are assembled as trimer. They form a bowl-like structure, and one assumes that the substrates accumulate in this bowl-like opening. Each subunit contains eight transmembrane domains and two herpin-like structures. And the current concept is that coupled transport uh, occurs by the, alt by the uh, consecutive opening and closing of these two hairpin-like loops that give alternating access of the substrates to central binding sites and allowing their, uh, their simultaneous unbinding on the other side. Whereas coupled transport is well understood, we, we know very little about anion transport. And, and uh, anion transport is, for, for various reasons, for my interest in glutamate transport, and of course, for my interest in anion channel, like one of the focus of my laboratory in the last years. So what I would like to tell about today are two, two aspects. So what is the physiological role of, of EAT anion channels? And what is the molecular basis of these two uh, different transport processes in EATs. How it is possible that one protein can make complicated conformational changes to move glutamate and sodium and proton and at the same time act as an, as an onion channel. We use, to address this question, we use molecular techniques. So 
uh, everything we do in the lab is based on recombinant DNA techniques and on heterologous expression. And the experiments I will report today are uh, on one side the functional characterization of mammalian glutamate transporter in transfected cells. And for this, I will focus on one glial and one neuronal glutamate transporter. The other one is the use of fluorescent spectroscopy, either on purified bacterial transporter, or Purococcus horikoshi, the same one we know, the high-resolution structure, or from neuronal glutamate transporters expressed in Senopus oocytes. Yeah, um, I would like to start with the functional characterization of, of EAT anion channels. And, and my first slide shows basically how easy it is to, 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 to follow this particular transport process of, of EATs. And, and it illustrates our experimental approach to, to study the function of this. So we take this is about EAT4, a neuronal glutamate transporter, express it in mammalian cell, and study currents with a whole cell variant of the Pechtlam technique. We, use we substitute intracellular potassium by sodium. This abolishes the glutamate uptake, and the remaining currents are exclusively EAT-associated anion currents. And this shows a recording from a single cell under these conditions in the absence of glutamate. What you can see is these are voltage uh, responses to cur vol current responses to voltage steps between minus 115 and plus 125 millivolt. You see a certain current, which is highly dependent on the extracellular, um, on the extracellular anion. This one is only present in cells which heterologously express EAT isoforms. It can be blocked by glutamate transport blocker. This is the EAT-associated anion current in the absence of glutamate. It is active in the absence of glutamate, but it can be modified by the transport substrate. This is shown in the next slide here. We use, like, like our typical anion, we use symmetrical nitrate to increase anion X, anion outward and anion inward current, and which gives us current amplitudes in the range of several nanoamps so that they are easily observed. They are not too big, they are not too small, they are just perfect. The left side you see uh, current recording in the absence of glutamate, stepping from 0 millivolt to minus 150 millivolt, you see an instantaneous increase. The anion conducting unit or the anion channel is active at 0 millivolt, and at negative voltages, you see a time dependent increase due, uh, yeah, due to a change of the number of open channels. Upon steps in the positive voltage range, you see an inverse process. The current increases simultaneously with a voltage step. And then you see a decay with voltage due to a reduction in the number of active channels. Applying glutamate increases the current amplitude over the whole voltage range. In the positive as well as in the negative range, the current amplitudes are bigger. And moreover, the, the time and voltage dependent changes. So this EAT4 um, anion current shows the time and voltage dependent changes in current amplitudes. And for me, coming from the ion channel field for a long time, this was like a typical signature of an ion channel. I thought this, is, this must be a <coughs> gated channel. It must, it must behave the same way as, as, as voltage dependent sodium, cation, or, or anion channel. But uh, I, I was wrong. And this is basically exactly what we, the behave, exact behavior what we expect for a transporter in which some of the transport states are associated with an active ion channel, with an active anion channel. Glutamate transport can be represented by a cyclic uh, reaction scheme, and the transporter uh, propagates through these different states by association with different substrates. First one sodium bind, then two, and the glutamate, a proton, the third sodium, and then there's a conformational change, and then uh, the, the substrate dissociate, and there's a translocation of the potassium bound transporter. If you assume that only some of these states are associated with an 
open anion channel, this reaction scheme uh, predicts a voltage-dependent and time-dependent changes of the current amplitude, and moreover, substrate-dependent changes, because depending on the substrate which are present in the extra intracellular solution, certain state can be uh, achieved or not. So the first question we, we addressed uh, about EIT anion channel was about the basic molecular mechanism underlying this macroscopic currents you have seen here. So it is really an ion channel, an aqueous conduction pathway with, with, with high translocation rates, or could it be also a uniporter, like, like a glucose transporter, or a slippage mode that within this trans reaction scheme, there are certain states, short-lived uh, transition states in which the, the, the transporter, due to some imperfection in the conformational change, shortly becomes anion conducting. And to distinguish between these different processes, we performed noise analysis. Noise analysis is mathematically demanding and it is uh, not, uh, not easy to understand, but it is the only way to, to, to look at this type of channel. And this is why I would like to give you like a short introduction to it. So noise analysis relies on, 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 on the noise of, of a macroscopic current and the variation of the current amplitude. And for ion channels, we know a lot about the determinants of, of this current variance. We know that the larger is the unitary current amplitude, the single channel current amplitude, the larger is the noise. And the, the smaller, the percentage of time the channel uh, dwells in his open time, the smaller is this variance. And the mathematical description gives that the ratio of the variance by the current amplitude is the product of the unitary current amplitude times one minus the absolute open probability. And the absolute open probability is the percentage of time the channel is open. What we did, we, we, we developed a standard uh, noise analysis a little further, and we did a transformation by which we divided this ratio by the instantaneous current amplitude, the current amplitude immediately after the voltage step. The idea is that during the voltage step, the number of active EIT channels won't change. So the instantaneous current amplitude is proportional to the unitary current amplitude. And the ratio of unitary current amplitude and instantaneous current amplitude is a constant value. And this transformation predicts that plotting this value versus the ratio of the late and the early current amplitude will give a linear relationship. And this is an actual experiment. From this linear relationship, one can fit a straight. The slope of the straight gives you the number of active channels, and the y-axis intercept gives you a value from which you can calculate by knowing the instantaneous current amplitude, the unitary current amplitude. Okay, this is, everybody can, who wants, would like to do, can think about this later. Uh, this is the results we got from, from this, and these are single channel amplitude of EIT4 anion channels in the absence and in the presence of glutamine. Right. And what you can see is that these unitary current amplitudes are not as small as we, we, we initially um, expected. It has a conductance of around one picosiemens. It's not huge, it's not like a calcium activated K channel or invert rectifying K channel, but it is well comparable with a, with a CLC type chloride channel, with a muscle type chloride channel CLC1, or a neuronal chloride channel CLC2. Knowing the unitary current amplitude and the number of, of channels, one can determine absolute open probability. And what one sees is that in the presence of glutamate, the absolute open probability is homogeneous. It is close to one. This channel is almost always open for EIT4. And from this, conclude, we conclude that it is indeed it is an aqueous channel which spent long times in its open conformation. It looks like a channel. And to support this idea, we did another type of experiments. We measured, measured reversal potentials under B-ionic conditions. For this, we dialyzed the cells internally with nitrate and perfused them with another anion, thiocyanate. 
And then we kept the ratio of these two ion concentration constant, but changed the absolute, uh, con the absolute concentration of both anions. If we had a transporter which binds an anion, makes a conformational change, and then the anion dis uh, di dissociates, then the reversal potential should be independent of the absolute concentration. The same if the channel could only bind a single ion. In both cases, one would expect that this value of the reversal potential does not change. But this is not the case. It changes with the absolute uh, concentration of both anions. And from this, we conclude that the anions permeate through a multiply occupied pore. And a multiply occupied pore is something that we see in many very effective ion channels, most notably in potassium channels, where three potassium ions occupy the selectivity filter. And the, the electrostatic interaction between these ions uh, is one of the reasons for the very effective transport rates. These two results make us believe that um, ET4 anion conduction occurs in an effective way by a multiply occupied pore with many functional properties which are very similar to conventional ion channels. We became very enchanted by by the voltage dependence of these currents and, and mainly to improve our noise analysis and, 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 and to observe these time and voltage dependent changes. We did all times of voltage steps and, and by doing this, like playing around with this, we realized something which I believe is, is physiologically very important and this is shown here. It is a novel gating process which is very slow. For this experiment, we keep the cells at an asymmetric ionic condition. Inside is chloride, which is not so permeable. Outside is nitrate. And we held the cell at its reversal potential, which is around minus 70, minus 80 millivolt. And then we apply a 60 millivolt step in the positive range, uh, followed by a short step to minus 120 millivolt. And we vary the length of these depolarizing prepoles. What one can see is that at the positive range, there's no change of the current amplitude. In the negative range, we see a time-dependent increase of the current amplitude with a time constant of about seconds. This is why we dubbed it the slow gate. It's a very, very slow process. Moreover, the current at the reversal potential at the beginning, suddenly there is an anion outward current at this time. So there's obviously a change of a reversal, change of the selectivity, a change of the reversal potential of this channel, which indicates a change of the selectivity of the ion channel. And this is investigated in more detail in the next slide. Here, a similar pulse protocol is applied, but now we do not step directly to a negative voltage, but we apply like a, a ramp-like voltage step. So we change the voltage with which time, and this allows us to apply, uh, to construct current voltage relationships after different pre duration. And here you can see very clearly the change of the reversal potential. Without pre it reverses at around minus 70 millivolts. And after 11.2 seconds at plus 60 millivolt, it suddenly reverses at minus 25 millivolt. Such a process is only possible if a change of selectivity occurs. So these channels are not anymore perfectly anion selective, but they allow the passage of other ions. And to test those, we did all types of ion substitution experiments. And I just show you the two in which we observe change. And this is sodium. Here, this is again the reversal potential obtained from these ramp-like protocols versus the prepulse duration for three different external sodium concentrations. You can see in all three cases, the time dependence is the same, but the steady state reversal potential changes with sodium, indicating that EAT4 gets partially sodium permeable uh, after long prepulses. The same is true for changes in the external calcium concentration. Obviously, this channel gets cation permeable during long depolarizing pulses. An obvious counter-argument against these experiments is that there's no neuron which will be depolarized for 11.2 seconds at plus 60 millivolts. So we tried some 
physiological uh, voltage steps. And for this, we took those from a, uh, from a report from Genius and Sugimura from 1980. ET4 is expressed in Purkinje cells, and Purkinje cells experience a long-lasting series of action potentials. And we applied similar pulse protocols with different, uh, with a different frequency of the action potential. But we could show that under physiological pulse protocol, like action potential with a frequency of 50 hertz, we indeed see the activation, the slow activation of EIT4 onion channel. And this uh, yeah, made us to, to postulate something physiologically very important. Um, like under resting condition, the EIT onion currents are perfectly anion selective. And for many neurons, uh, they will have an inhibitory effect due to the uh, small intracellular and onion concentration. In contrast, after series of action potential, an excitatory sodium or potassium calcium anion currents occur. So slow activation permits a dynamic switch between inhibitory and excitatory currents without alteration of bulk ionic concentration. And we postulated that ELT associated anion channels might play a role in the regulation of excitability. Unfortunately, we have not been able to find a system in which, a neuronal system in which we could really observe changes of, of, of excitation uh, due to EIT associated anion channels. And this is mostly due that the two main players, EIT4 and EIT5, are, pre are present in, in neuronal populations which are very difficult to observe electrophysiologically. So uh, at the moment, this is such simply a suggestion and an important biophysical op observation, EITs to exhibit an anion channel which changes its selectivity depending on the excitation state of the cells in which these transporters are expressed. In the last part of my talk, I would like to speak about the molecular determinants of ELT anion channels. So back to this initial question, how this is possible that a transporter is also an anion channel? And uh, the final aim of this is to understand, like, to, to know the anion conduction pathway and to describe conformational changes of the anion conduction pathway at a molecular level. And the first question we addressed was, was this one. Is, could it be that the anion moves through the same ion conduction pathway as the other substrates? Or alternatively, are there two separate ion conduction pathways? like one for the scuppled transport and the other one for the anions. And can these be active at the same time or are they alternating active? Can be an EIT transporter, either a secondary active transporter or an anion channel? And after describing this slow gate, I would have bet that it is a single ion conduction pathway because it made so much sense. Like you have a pathway where the sodium and the glutamate goes normally, crosses normally uh, through the membrane and, and it would make perfect sense as, as a single, or in my mind at this time, it made perfect sense that a single conduction pathway is present for glutamate, sodium, protons, and potassium and after some minor conformation for anions such as chloride, nitrate, and thiocyanate. To distinguish between these possibilities, we took a biochemical approach and we used the glutamate transporter uh, from the Rococcus horikoshi of the known three-dimensional structure. And we inserted the tryptophan uh, at a position at helix four. After we expressed this mutant in bacteria, uh, purified it after solubilization, and uh, studied uh, fluorescence emission after excitation with 295 uh, nanomolar. This one, this approach, this, this fluorescence spectroscopic uh, approach allows a simple way to study the substrate dependence uh, or the, 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 the substrate association with the transporter. And this is shown here. Here you see a fluorescent spectra at two different aspartate concentrations. This transporter prefers aspartate over glutamate. And you can see that with increasing aspartate concentration, the maximum of the spectrum increases. If you plot the maximum versus the aspartate concentration, 
you get a nice bi concentration dependence, a binding curve for aspartate. We did this for the two different chloride concentrations, for 5 millimolar and 490 millimolar chloride. And you can see that the two substrate dependency perfectly superimposed. And we concluded from this that there is no uh, substrate competition between chloride and glutamate. The next experiment is basically the same approach. We now did not study uh, steady state fluorescence, but used fast application of sodium in this case via a stop flow mechanism and observed the time dependent changes of fluorescence after rapid application of sodium. And again, you see the same result, uh, regardless whether it is in the absence of chloride or a very high chloride concentration, this, the change of fluorescence uh, reporting conformational changes of the bacterial glutamate transporter is the same. And we conclude from this that there is no binding competition between chloride and glutamate, and uh, this indicates that there are different conduction pathways for permanent anions and glutamate. The next question was now, can they be active at the same time? And uh, this was a question um, we, we, we solved accidentally by studying a mutation uh, which was reported before, uh, a mutation in which a, a highly conserved aspartic acid at the end of the second transmembrane domain was neutralized. And another group, uh, Bob Vandenberg's group, had reported that this Glutamate, this aspartate side change is the gate of the channel, so it opens and closes it. And, and we repeated these experiments he performed in another isoform in ERT4. Here you can see on the left side wild type, with and without and with glutamate, and here the mutant. And you see two very important changes. First of all, there's a dramatic change in the gating of this, this channel. So here you see a deactivation at positive and at negative ranges. And here you see a very pronounced increase at, volt, at, at positive voltages. And moreover, the substrate import dependence is completely altered. Like in D117A um, ERT4, there's a decrease of the current amplitude by glutamate uh, as opposed to the pronounced glutamate-dependent increase in wild type ERT4. To understand these, these, these mutant effects, we did conventional biophysics, we did noise analysis, and, oh, sorry, um, this is about the location of this um, mutation in, in uh, three-dimensional structures in two different conformations, and one can see that D117 is far away from the substrate binding site. So this effect, these changes in the substrate dependence cannot be explained by a direct effect on substrate association. Okay, so we did noise again, and the results were yeah, in many aspects satisfying and other aspects surprising. On the left side wild type, you've seen this already, and on the right side D117A, what you can see is that this mutation reduces the unitary conductance by a factor of two. So basically this means that D117A must be close to the ion conduction pathway. This is the first mutation in an EAT that really reduces the unitary ion conduction pathway. The other one, you see a very profound change in the absolute open probability. You see that in the absence of glutamate, the absolute open probability is larger than in its presence, and moreover, the voltage dependence is profoundly changed. Okay, so this was the result like one and a half year ago, and then we tried to publish it. And I don't know, will happen, has happened to some of you, will happen to all of you. Most likely you have this paper and data look kind of nice, but, but you don't have a punchline. And so you look for another strategy. And the strategy we did uh, is, was very mathematical. We tried to, uh, to, to model these, these, these changes of, 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 of gating. And we used this state diagram you have I have shown you at the beginning, um, which uh, like connects uh, different states of the transporter, and there are certain states which are associated with an active anion channel. 
and they modify just the transition between these different states. And this is the result, and uh, it did not look so bad. So like you have these difference, like you see the activation of D117A, and you see this B phasic gating of wild type. But the main problem was that whatever we did, like we modified for weeks like parameters and did like evol uh, evolutionary fitting procedures, we could never accomplish an absolute open probability of Walter of more than 0 0.2, which is like five times smaller than the, 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 the actual observed result. So what we did then next is we in, in, in inserted additional open states branching from the transport cycle. So we did these steps, which at the first time looks like, like some extra errors in a complicated diagram. But biologically, this means something very important. Like we introduced an open state of the anion channel, which stops the uptake cycle. So at the moment the transporter enters into this open state, the uptake cycle cannot proceed. So these additional branching open states make a transition of the transporter between transporter and channel. At the moment it goes into the open channel, it cannot transport glutamate. There's, it is either a transporter or a channel. And this one allows an almost perfect uh, resemblance of our measured data. So we could perfectly predict wild type data. The change of D117A and wild type is just by modifying two open probabilities. The one P1 associated with the transporter which binds one sodium and P6 which associates with the fully bound transporter in its outward conformation. So we have now a mathematical description and now then we wanted to fill it like this with, with life, like what could be a biological process, which could be the, the, the biological process which brings the transporter from a transporter mode in a channel mode. And then uh, we remembered some, some old data uh, we had generated years before and we never really could un explain. And this is the dependence of EAT4, wild type EAT4 anion channel gating for different chloride concentrations. And these results, this is like at, uh, for different nitrate concentrations. This is one <coughs> nitrate external, and this is 140 nitrate external. You can see that the, the relative change of current amplitude are very different depending on the chloride anion concentration on both sides. This is a quantitative description. It plots relative open probabilities at the voltage for different anion concentration, and this shows a clear anion dependence of voltage dependent gating. In D117A, this effect was <coughs> abolished. So for every anion concentration, we saw the same, uh, the same uh, uh, voltage dependent of open probabilities. So D117A abolishes the anion dependence of EAT4 anion channels. And from this, we conclude, first of all, that there is an anion depending switching between transporter and channel function. So either the whole thing works as a transporter and the anion channel is closed, or it is an active uh, channel and there is no transporter function. This model very satisfactorily explained that there are two types of glutamate transporter. There are some glutamate transporter with a high transport rate and little anion current, and there are others with very small transport rates and high transport rates. It's just a switch between transporter and channel function. Okay, so. This is the conclusion of this part. EIT glutamate transporter switches between two different functional modes. They can either secondary active transporter uh, and or they can function as anion channel. And the permanent anion stabilizes the channel mode of EIT4. We have not shown this for other transporters, but we believe that a similar process is taking place. 
Okay, I, I will rush a little bit. So if, if, if it is about a different technique, which we took a lot of effort and which I find very cool, but basically it just supports this idea. And this is voltage clamp fluorometry. Um, voltage clamp fluorometry um, is based on the expression of these transporters in oocytes. Uh, you express heterologously these transporters and you insert cysteines at, at, at certain positions and add like a cysteine specific uh, fluorescent label. And then you observe like uh, fluorescent values at different voltages or different substrate ap application. And this technique has been introduced in ion channel research by, by Ehud Isakov and Pancho Besani and is like, like the typical method which, which you study conformational changes of a transmembrane domain. And we did uh, the same with uh, ELT3. It's a little iso different isoform, but expresses very well, so it has like technical advantages over ERT4 or ERT1. Uh, but basically, they all are expected to work in, in principle the same. And here you can see like changes of fluorescence at negative voltage steps, it simply increases. At positive, is it increases and then decays in a time and voltage dependent manner. When you step back to zero millivolt, you see like a tail, like it returns to initial, uh, to initial fluorescent value. And uh, this is due to changes of the environment of the fluorescent label and basically indicates that there are changes of conformation. When you add glutamate, you get pronounced changes of this. Uh, fluorescent values, like at steps in, negative voltage, in the negative voltage range, you see now a change, an increase of the fluorescent amplitude in contrast to the decrease in the absence of glutamate. These fluorescent changes we do not observe in uninjected transporters, and they are mainly abolished by TBAO. TBAO-A is a non-transported blocker of of, of glutamate transporter, it binds into the binding pocket and prevents the conformational changes uh, um, which are bound to, to glutamate transport. So here are steady state values. This is a change of the fluorescence um, without glutamate at the end of this voltage step. And this is a change of the fluorescence in the presence of glutamate. And with a little fantasy, you can see these Voltage, the voltage dependence of the absolute open probability, it is biphasic in the presence of glutamate, and it is monophasic without glutamate. Okay, um, the next thing was to check is there an anion dependence, and, and this is shown here uh, in sodium chloride with and without glutamate, and here it is after application of gluconate. So we substitute chloride by the impermeant anion gluconate. What you can see is that there are indeed anion dependent changes of these conformational changes, which is shown here in the summary slide. Uh, the, the round symbol is in chloride, and the, 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 the square symbol is in the presence of, of, of anions. And you can see there's an anion dependent conformational change. If you do the same in D83A, this is the same mutation in ERT3 as uh, I showed and modeled before in ERT4, you can see that the effects of permanent anions are completely abolished. From this we conclude um, that, yeah, the same what we concluded before, but now with more sophisticated uh, methods, there are conformational changes. Uh, which are modified by permanent anions, and D83A abolishes the anion effects on ERT3 conformational changes. Okay, so this is my final conclusion, which is very general and, and yeah, just repeats my, my former conclusions. So glutamate transporters mediate two different transport modes. They can be secondary active glutamate, or an end anion conduction. Uh, the both transport function cannot be performed at the same time. They function either as anion channel or as glutamate transporter. And glutamate transport is crucial for glutamate hemostasis. This I have not shown, but others. 
but there's good evidence that the EAT anion channels, which uh, plays a direct role in modifying cellular excitability. And yeah, um, I hope we can, uh, we can um, like, like specify this effect of, on cellular excitability in more detail. Yeah, um, work on glutamate transporter, as um, Christian Steinhäuser said, already started in Aachen, um, which is a nicer church than, than Hannover. Uh, and these are the people who have been involved in this. Nico Melzer was a medical student who defined and, and characterized the slow gait. Um, Delany Torres did much work on, on the substrate dependence of this transporter. And Philip is a man, medical student who started kinetic modeling in, in, in my group. Peter Kobermann has studied D117A and, and, and yeah, made gold of, out of this project, which um, like I, I did not expect that we will get so much out of this. David Evers and Yamin Hotzi are responsible for fluorescent spectroscopy. And Natalie Winter has studied uh, the disease causing mutation. Um, Patti Hidalgo and Günther Schmalzing um, helped us to start uh, protein purification, um, protein overexpression, and protein purification, which is the basis of, of, of fluorescent spectroscopy on purified transporters. Thank you very much. Thank you.